I'm going to start off the semester uh, going over chapter one, which is basically the foundation of statistics to give you an idea of the information that you will need to know to understand the more complex uh, statistics later on in the semester. But first and foremost, I want to talk to you about how this is going to be beneficial to you as a student. So we hear statistics every day, all the time. We see statistics, we are um, met with information frequently that's based off of statistics. And I really want you to be able to think about it critically and question uh, statistics if it is uh, if it appears misleading or if you're not sure where the data came from or what the study was about. I want you to be able to make decisions rather than just accepting the information as a given because truthfully we can use statistics to lie. We can use statistics to bias the information. It might be um, based off of data but it's the way that we interpret the data which can make things misleading. So the first thing I like you to do is just take a look at a graph that was um, shown in the media. So and this was a long time ago, so I, uh, we're not dealing with anything extraordinarily controversial right now. But um, if I looked at this graph and asked, like, why is this misleading? Um, you might be able to um, state to me maybe some things that you believe are misleading about it. But if I wasn't asking that question, you might accept this information as a given, as this is the way it is, that there um, you know, is a major difference uh, now compared to previously as far as um, these tax rates. So what I really want you to look at, though, is some of the reasons why this is misleading. So first of all, the scale. So we have an X and a Y axis. So the X axis is that horizontal axis. The Y axis is the vertical axis. And so really, it, the, if you look at this vertical axis, the lowest number on there, um, you know, kind of highlight right here. Sorry, if, if there's a delay, I'll use red. I think red will show up better. Yeah. Um, if you look right here, it's starting at 34. So it should be starting at zero. And then each of the increments above it should be equal. So, you know, if it started at zero, then it would maybe be 10, then 20, then 30, then 40. Uh, and so it needs to be equal increments. So another thing that I feel is misleading is the font and the numbers. So here, like we have this huge font for the title, okay? But then we have tiny font for these percentages because they kind of don't want you to really look at the percentages. They, they want you to just look at these bars uh, and go, wow, this one is much bigger than this one. And not even really look at the numbers. So if you hear barking during these, uh, I'll pause it. I do have dogs and I am doing this from home. So you might hear barks once in a while. It's usually the mailman uh, and, and he seems to come at different times of day. So I can never just totally count on it being at the same time. Sorry about that. So um, they're really trying to kind of persuade our eyes to avoid the numbers and um, focus on just the bar size. That's, that's a way of misleading the information. So the graph is suggesting uh, a 400% increase in price and, and these tax rates, but in actuality, there's only an 11% increase because the bar size looks like 400%, but it's only the difference between, you know, a, a very, very, very small um, percentage difference. So we want to make sure that we're really clear about um, when we look at the information that's given to us, is this, is this a, a, a very um, appropriate a representation of the information? 
And, and there's lots of reasons why this is done in society. For one, um, it, it's often media driven or a, a group that is trying to persuade people one way or the other. Uh, as researchers, we want to be able to catch this and we also want to be able to present our own data and our own research in an appropriate non-biased manner. So here's really what it should look like. This is a, a much more accurate representation. So here we have the tax rates. We have the y-axis starting at zero. It's going in 10% increments, each one, and it actually starts at 0% rather than at 30%. And so the difference in these bars is very little. I mean, at, at the very top of this bar, it, it, it's not that much of a gap in between them. So this is a much more accurate representation. We have um, appropriate font size so that we can really see there's not a huge jump. Uh, we can see um, the intervals uh, are the same, meaning 10%, 20%, it's all by 10% increments. So this is a much more accurate, unbiased representation. So when you see this kind of information in the media, I'd like you to be able to kind of look back and go, wait a minute, does this look like it's a consistent way to represent this information? Or does this information, does it seem like it's being presented to me to persuade me? And if information is, is being presented in a manner that it seems like it's trying to be persuasive, it probably is biased. And I want you to be able to catch that. So another um, example is um, this was in an article quite some time ago, but I think it's just such a perfect representation of when we should question information, an absolute time that we should question information. So in this, it, it, the article title was, why have there been more mass shootings under Obama than the four previous presidents combined? And then they give us this graph. Well, automatically it's, basically telling us there have been more mass shootings under Obama and it's asking why and then this graph it shows you know mass shootings are four or more people in one setting you know here we have Reagan there were 11 <clears throat> Bush senior 12 Clinton 23 Bush junior 20 and then Obama is all the way at 162 this is almost suggesting that the, the minute Obama walked into the White House, he was just handing out guns or something. And so this should be an automatic trigger for you to be like, wait a minute, where is this data coming from? And if you really think about it, has there really been 162 mass shootings? Does, this seems like a huge jump. And, and so that's where you want to start questioning things and go, wait a minute, where are they getting their information? And how are they defining mass shootings? So these are things that you want to be aware of and, and kind of look more in depth into things. So when I looked into this article to find out what in the world, you know, um, how they came up with 162 shootings, mass shootings under Obama, how did they come to this huge number compared to these other presidents? So here's kind of some things that I looked at. First of all, hopefully none of your instructors have ever told you that it's okay for you to do your research using Wikipedia. Probably should not because it's um, not going to be accurate. It's not always going to be accurate. The Wikipedia, any person can get on there and alter the information. And Mother Jones database, um, Either Wikipedia or Mother Jones might be good sources to start with to kind of get an idea of what is out there normally, but we want to make sure that we're using um, appropriate ethical databases and ethical resources, and we want to make sure that is matched with other um, types of uh, research um, that is ethically representative. So the problem with using database from Wikipedia and Mother Jones is the definition of mass shootings differs. The definitions for mass shootings for Wikipedia and Mother Jones is different than the definition of mass shootings by um, the FBI or the government, our government who collects data 
regarding uh, mass shootings. So uh, mass shooting is typically uh, uh, four or more people in one public setting at one time and the people that are involved in the shootings are usually strangers or some public setting where it's not domestic. Whereas um, they included just for Obama's, when they collected the numbers for Obama, they also included domestic murders, which was four or more people at one time. So if let's say a father kills the entire family and there is four or more people in the family, they were including that in the um, data for mass shootings. So that's problematic. You have to have the same definition for all of them and you have to collect the data in the same way and you have to use um, <clears throat> resources that are appropriate and ethically bound uh, resources. So I, I actually um, dug in to the government database and I looked at um, their definition for mass shootings and I looked at the numbers of mass shootings under each of those presidents and I decided to show a, a, a graph that would be better representative of truly what the data looks like. So here is what I came up with. If you'll notice, you know, Ronald Reagan 6, George W. H. W. Bush 8, Bill Clinton 18, George W. Bush 15, Barack Obama was 26. He did have more shootings than the others, but it isn't nearly as massive as the other presidencies. And if you look at this pattern, these are by years, the later years to the more present years. And um, this was conducted at the end of Obama's presidency. We haven't been able to get any get into the data yet for during Trump's presidency because this was at the end of Barack Obama's presidency. But if you'll notice, there's a pattern. The um, mass shootings have just gone up in general. So it seems like it's less about which president is in the office and more about our society and our culture in general. And, and so, but they wanted us to just see it as about that president. So uh, it's very interesting uh, to be able to actually critically look at this information and um, challenge our thinking and maybe not believe everything that's presented to us and maybe um, look into it a little bit more in depth so that we can actually be um, much better critical thinkers and, and consumers of information. So this was, I know a lengthy process for me to explain to you why on earth are you learning statistics? Because if you're not going to use it in psychology or in research, if you're not gonna be conducting research, you're probably thinking why? And if you're not going to be in a field where you're going to be reading a lot of research, you might be thinking why? Well, as citizens, as, as people, we're presented with information on a daily basis we should be able to critically think about that information and decide whether it's truthful or biased. And that's what I'm hoping at the bare minimum you get out of this class. So with that said, okay, hopefully this works. I'll have to double check, but um, I went back and let's look at what statistics is in general. We're gonna be working with statistics the entire semester. And these are just math procedures that we use to interpret our observations, to summarize them, to use them to predict other things. Um, so they're just mathematical procedures to make sense of things. So it's all based on data and everything that we observe or the information that we collect is somehow converted to data, which is numbers assigned to the observations. And so there, the, these are typically called scores or raw scores. When you look at it as a whole, we talk about data. And so whenever um, we're using these procedures to kind of um, summarize uh, information about um, observations that we make, let's say I, I'm looking at um, how many aggressive behaviors 13-year-old boys uh, have during a school day. Um, I might I might provide you the entire data, so all of the observations, 
or I might, you know, look at just some of the scores or the raw scores for the data, or I might summarize it with like an average or something to that extent. This is all statistics. If I'm not looking at every um, person in the world or every 13 year old boy in the world, I'm looking at a group of individuals and I'm gonna summarize those. So this is what we're gonna be working with. And it allows us to analyze things quantitatively. So basically, if we think quantitative, it, in a, a manner where there is values attached to where we can say this is more or this is less rather than any kind of subjective, like this is nice or this is good. It's like this has more frequency than this. So that's where it's quantitative. So there's two different branches of statistics that we're gonna focus on this semester. The first um, part of the semester, we're really going to be just looking at the most basic, which is descriptive statistics. And these are usually um, those procedures that um, are somehow quantifying measured behaviors, like giving us averages or giving us um, tables. It, it's giving us um, some way to summarize the information. It, it allows us to just not look at a thousand numbers and try to make sense of it. It somehow describes the data in some simpler way. Now, it's not going to tell us about what we would see if this happens or if we have tested a hypothesis. Descriptive statistics is exactly how it sounds. It just describes the data, that's all it does. Now, later on, in the semester, we're gonna be using inferential statistics. That's where we get to infer. So we take the descriptive statistics and then we take it a step further and we actually uh, um, create mathematical procedures so that we can start drawing conclusions about the statistics. So we basically are taking a sample and we're inferring about the population. So if I have five people and I say, oh, these people, have some special characteristic. And if I test them in this situation, this is what we would see with these types of people in the general population. That would be inferential statistics. And that's what we'll be doing down the road. So uh, right now we're just going to focus on just descriptive statistics. So some key things uh, about statistics is understanding um, the terms. And really this is the basic um, uh, aspect of learning uh, the foundation for the remainder of the semester. So we're really going to be um, using statistics the most, um, but often we're going to be talking about parameters and population as well. So we have, uh, if we think about um, population, that's everyone, uh, <clears throat> every individual of interest. So if I'm talking about adolescent girls, I'm not just talking about adolescent girls in Mesa, Arizona, unless I spe specifically say all adolescent girls in Mesa, Arizona, which in that case, all adolescent girls in Mesa, Arizona would be my population. But if I'm talking about all adolescent girls, I'm talking about every adolescent girl out there as being part of the population. And if I said, well, the average, um, maybe IQ of a population is um, 100. So if you remember from uh, introductory psychology, if we use the Stanford Binet, the average IQ is 100. Well, that is uh, a population value because we've done the Stanford Binet so many times across so many um, uh, pop different samples and so many different cultures and so many different um, situations that we now consider it a population because we're seeing the same results across and across. So we consider it, um, it we have these standards. So an average IQ of 100 is a parameter, which is a value that describes the population. But most of the time, we, we, we don't have access to everyone in the population. So we have to take a, a smaller group of people that represent the population. And when we have a smaller group that represents the population, that's called a sample. 
And if we have values that describe the sample, let's say um, my, a sample of, of people have an average IQ of 105, well, that, that 105, that value is a statistic. It's a value that describes a sample instead of a value that describes a population. It's a subset of the population. Most of the behavioral research that we do is on samples because our, the groups, the population groups that we are, are um, researching, we can't access everyone. So we have to use a smaller subset of people that would represent the larger um, uh, population out there. So um, is what happens is we take descriptive statistics and we start summarizing the sample results, like giving averages or we provide tables, those types of things. So kind of some differentiation um, between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Again, when we're de using descriptive statistics, we're summarizing. When we're using inferential statistics, we're taking the statistics and we are generalizing to the population saying, this is what you know, it would look like in the general population is what we would be doing. So kind of to just uh, remember when I I'll use the term parameter, that means I, it's a value um, that is describing the population. If we use the term statistic, it's a value that describes the sample. So there are, there are values. So if I say the average IQ of Americans is 100, that's a parameter because that's a population average. If I say the average IQ of my students in statistics class is 110, that's a statistics, a statistic because you're a smaller subset of the larger population. So just to kind of refresh on, on samples and populations. So there are basic ways that we do our research in the social behavioral sciences. Now these are not every way out there, there are other ways, but these are the three common research methods that we're gonna talk about and we're gonna talk about um, very specifically these, how they apply to um, the research methods used in statistics. And we're gonna look at them kind of in depth because truthfully, depending upon the, your data and what you're looking at is gonna depend upon the type of method you're using, whether it's experimental method, quasi-experimental or correlational. So some of this might be, um, familiar to you and it might be review which is good um, because that means that it'll be easier for you to grasp if it's new you might want to like um, review a little bit more in depth because no matter what psychology is a science and we do use the scientific method it's just not as straightforward as a lot of the other fields where there's a lot more control involved there's sometimes there's not a lot of control in human behavior so first and foremost, we're gonna look at the experimental method. The experimental method, um, some key aspects to this um, is that this is the only type of method that we can actually state cause and effect. One thing causes another. That's the only, only time that we can ever say cause and effect is if we're using the experimental method. And the reason is, is that there's these criteria that we have to meet. So there's a lot of control so that of all the possible variables so that we can isolate what the cause and effect are. Whereas in many other research cases, we don't have that control. So unless it's an experimental method, we cannot ever state cause and effect. So there's three types of criteria that has to be met to meet the qualification for an experimental design. One is manipulation, or manipulation, the second is randomization, and the third is basically control. And we're gonna talk about these in depth uh, a little bit so that you can understand specifically what I mean, because there's a lot to this um, that can seem confusing. So first, um, to meet the experimental criteria for manipulation, we must have a true independent variable. So an independent variable is a variable that the researcher has control over and can manipulate. So for example, um, 
whether or not people are exposed to a new teaching method or a traditional method. So you, the independent variable in this would be the type of teaching, like the teaching method. So you're gonna manipulate who goes into the new teaching method and who goes into the traditional teaching method. Independent variable can be confusing because ultimately, when I say what is the independent variable and you see two things, new teaching method and traditional teaching method, you automatically wanna to jump to one thing but actually is independent variable is basically the, the, the grouping variable. So how groups are distinguished. So it could be um, if you're trying out a new medication, one group receives the new medication and the other group receives a placebo. And so they think they're getting the medication, but it's just a sugar pill. So it, that independent variable would just be the treatment. It, you know, because it's an umbrella term for both of the groups. So when you think independent variable, there should actually be two groups if it's a true independent variable. And you can usually use one word to summarize those groups, or you can state both groups. The second criteria is the random assignment, and that's part of this grouping. So basically, um, every person in the study should have an equal chance of being in either the new teaching method group or the um, traditional teaching method group. So everyone is randomly assigned to each. So that's where uh, the a random assignment comes into. So each person should have, have equal chance. It shouldn't be, oh, the researcher really likes these people, so they're gonna go to the new teaching and the other ones are gonna go to the traditional teaching, no. It has to be equal um, assignment, so equal chance of being assigned to either one of the groups. So random assignment is used uh, for a true experimental method. And then the third, it, there's at least two groups observed. Again, so that's where we're going back to um, the independent variable having two groups. Okay, this might be difficult for you to see, but I, I've um, got a little whiteboard here, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm hoping that this helps you kind of look at how um, the independent variable and the groups are, uh, um, and how the dependent variable works. So the two groups observed would be, okay, so I always call the independent variable my umbrella term. So hopefully you can kind of see what I mean by the umbrella. And I have IV for independent variable. So the independent variable oversees the groups. So maybe for this, um, let's say the um, teaching method, uh, my independent variable actually equals um, teaching method. That's kind of a summary of what the groups represent, okay? So in this case, my IV is the teaching method. And then, so one of those groups is the control group. So the control group is, is either a group that receives a placebo or no, nothing new, it's just the typical. And then there's the experimental group. It's, it's the actual treatment or the new thing. So in this case, our control group would be the traditional teaching method. That's what's normal. So that traditional method. So I'm gonna put here uh, TM, TM, and it might be hard for you to see, but I'm writing that. So hopefully you can uh, put that in your notes, teaching the traditional method. And so this is the people that are in the traditional method. And then over here is the experimental group. That's the group that is exposed to the new uh, treatment or the new condition the, of the independent variable. So this would be the, the new teaching method. So in TM, so new teaching method, that's the experimental group. So within the independent variable, these two groups are um, split up, They're, people are randomly assigned into each of these groups. One of them is the experimental group, the other is the control group, 
and then both groups are measured on something, the same thing. So if we're looking at um, teaching methods, probably the outcome that we're looking for is their grades, right? That would be our DB or our dependent variable. So grades are gonna be measured in both of these groups. So that's the outcome. That is the dependent variable. So I always think of the dependent variable. The dependent variable depends upon whether they're in the control group or the experimental group. The outcome depends upon which group they're in. So that's kind of a way to look at dependent variable. Now, the, how we measure that is considered an operational definition, how we measure the outcome. So it could be maybe just an exam, it could be a grade, it could be a percentage, it could be a letter grade, it, it, it just depends. And that would be the operational definition of a dependent variable. So when we look at um, how we're distinguishing between independent and var dependent variables, sometimes it's challenging. Uh, sometimes I'll be asking, you know, um, uh, for you to tell me what uh, the independent variable is. And you might want to jump and say, oh, the new teaching method. Um, not necessarily. The new teaching method is the experimental group. It's part of the independent variable, but it's not all of it. So um, the independent variable often is kind of a summary. The type of teaching method would be the way to look at it. And then um, in this case, they were measuring specifically reading achievement scores. That was their operational definition. So they're um, specifically operationally defining their dependent variable uh, through reading achievement scores, specifically to see whether the new teaching method is better than the traditional teaching method. So this is really what people are looking for. And, and if we are truly using random assignment and we have a true independent that the researcher is able to manipulate, then we are actually able to say, um, yeah, the new teaching method caused an increase in reading achievement scores, if that's what we found. Uh, so it's the only time that we can actually state a cause and effect. So let's think about operational definition, just because it sometimes is difficult. Um, so operational definition is something you're gonna see over the uh, semester, but really is it is how to define some phenomenon. So let's think of math anxiety. Uh, many students uh, say they have math anxiety. And we think about, okay, how could we operationally define that? Well, there's lots of ways, but we have to be really direct. I've heard students say, well, um, you test them and see if um, they um, perform better on homework than they do uh, exams. Well, that doesn't really tell us about anxiety. That tells us about performance. And it doesn't necessarily mean anxiety. So we need to be really careful that we are actually operationally defining the variable we're looking for. So in this case, the variable we're looking for is math anxiety. So I have a couple of ways that we could do it. So we could ask students questions on a scale of zero to five. You know, on a scale of zero to five, zero meaning no anxiety at all, five being the worst anxiety ever, you know, how, um, much anxiety do you feel um, when you're given a math problem in the classroom? How much anxiety do you feel when you're given a math problem on an exam? How, you know, those types of things. Um, and then with five being more anxiety and zero being less. Or we could actually monitor physiological responses. So I could hook people up um, and measure their heart rate and blood pressure and obviously when we're anxious, our heart rate typically goes up and our blood pressure typically goes up. So we could see while people are taking tests if that's occurring. So these are ways that we could actually operationally define math anxiety. Or it could be something as simple as me walking up to a student saying, 
Do you experience math anxiety? Yes or no? As simple as that. It could be even something that sim simple. So operational definitions are how we create values to these um, phenomenons that we see within the world that we observe. So we'll be using operational definitions throughout the semester. So the other type of method that we are going to talk about for research is the quasi-experimental method. So a quasi-experimental method sometimes looks like a true experiment. Really the key is, is that the researcher does not have control of the study, does not have control of the groups. So a quasi-experiment might look like it. You might have two groups. So instead of the new teaching method versus the traditional teaching method, you might have um, girls versus boys and whether um, their reading achievement skill, uh, um, uh, skills differ. Well, the researcher has no control over whether someone is a girl or a boy. So you can't randomly assign them to the groups. They're just assigned to that group because of their innate characteristic of being either male or female. So there might be two groups, but the researcher has no control over them. So we could still operationally define uh, the dependent variable and we would have two groups, but we cannot state cause and effect because uh, being a boy does not cause you to do better as, as far as reading achievement scores. That's not necessarily the cause of it. We can't control everything else. So quasi-experiment looks like a, a, a true experiment, except for there is no control because the groups that distinguish is often based on some innate characteristic or trait that um, the researcher has no control over that quasi-experimental method. And last but not least is the correlational method, which is probably one of the most used research methods in um, uh, behavioral sciences. And so this is basically where we're looking at the strength and direction of the relationship between two or more variables. So now they're not conditions. We're looking at two variables and we're looking to see if there's a relationship between them. And if there is, what is the strength of the relationship and what's the direction of the um, relationship? We can't randomly assign because there isn't actual groups to control. So we're looking at uh, things like um, SAT scores and college GPA. So for each student, every freshman student, we can look back and see, oh, what was your SAT score? And then what's your current GPA? And then we look and see, is there a relationship? And we do often see that as um, students have higher SAT scores, they're, usually their freshman GPA is higher. So we see a relationship and we see that it's all, it's going up. As one goes up, the other goes up. And that's the correlational method. And that's used the most frequently in behavioral research because we often can't control situations and we often have to look at information in hindsight to look at what we've already done. So again, with correlation, we can't state cause and effect. We can use it to predict so we can see, you know, there is a high probability of a high GPA if a student has a high SAT scores. It's a high probability, but it's not an absolute and we can't say one causes the other. So it's all just about relationships. So those are the methods for research. But let's look at how we conduct the research and how we look at um, the information using data because that's really ultimately what we're going to be doing. So we have to look at things called classifications. So when we have a variable, um, our, like our dependent variable, we have to look at it and go, okay, how is it classified? So one of the ways that we look at classification is just what does the score mean? So we always put um, our observations, we create scores for them. And so what do the scores mean? So with a classification for continuous, it means that there can be decimals, absolutely. So it's a continuum, uh, the numbers could be any number 
beyond any decimal point, and they go on and on and on. Those are continuous. So think of any numbers that could be fractions or decimals are, is continuous data. That would be something like if I um, was measuring exam scores. Um, with exam scores, you could actually have uh, decimals, uh, whereas if I looked at letter grade, that's discrete. There is no halfway point. It's either A, B, C, D, or F. Um, whereas um, if we're looking at A, uh, a grade of an A using it in a continuous manner, it's anything from, uh, you know, 89.5, if you're doing the rounding, to, you know, 99.4. Uh, so, Anything like that is an A or 100% if you want to look at it that way. So um, that would be continuous because it could be anything within that decimal point. Whereas discrete is um, whole numbers or just categories, just basic categories. So um, gender, whether you're male or female, that's just a category. For statistics, we assign numbers to that, but the number is meaningless. So that's how we kind of look at um, the data in a sense to be able to distinguish. It's either discrete or continuous. So you're going to be asked, so tell me, like, what is the classification of a variable? You should be able to uh, tell me whether it's continuous or discrete, but it doesn't end there. Um, you also have to choose whether it's quantitative or qualitative because sometimes they, they uh, um, cross over. So you're either describing the data as continuous or discrete, and then you're choosing whether it's quantitative or qualitative. Now quantitative is that it varies by amount. So basically, does a larger number mean more? Can you subtract one number from the other to get a difference? That's quantitative, there's a quantity difference. Now you, with quantitative, you can have continuous or discrete. So if we're looking at um, weight, I mean, you could be 130.259 pounds, right? And that's decimals, that's continuous. But if we're looking at number of students in statistics, that's discrete because you might be half aware that you're here or watching this uh, video, but you're not counted as half a student. You're a whole student, no matter what. So that's discrete because it's whole numbers. So uh, quantitative, um, if we're looking at weight in pounds, it would be quantitative and continuous. If we're looking at numbers of students, it would be quantitative and discrete. So whenever you talk about classifications, you should be giving me two classifications. And when you look at qualitative, think about, um, categories you know you you just have categories there's no exact value difference so gender male versus free, female or it could be level of interest low medium and high high is higher than low but we don't have an exact amount we can't subtract low from high and get a difference there isn't an exact amount so we have to be real careful it's a quality difference rather than a quantity difference so these are the four different classifications and they're in groups. It's either discrete or continuous, quantitative versus qualitative. And whenever you're asked this, because you will be asked it on labs and you will be asked it on the exam, you should be giving me two different classifications from each of the categories of classifications. The next uh, we'll look at is scales of measurement. So scales of measurement, um, really is what tells us what type of statistical procedure we're going to use. So how are we going to summarize the data? How are we going to, going to make sense of this? How are we going to tell people in a manner that makes sense? And I'm sorry, this gets cut off where my picture is, but I'll describe it to you. So really the question of determining uh, between the scales of measurement is what does the number represent? So when you're thinking, oh, what do you mean a number? Male and female doesn't have a number. Well, when we're doing statistics and we put this information into software, it, it does. We have to provide a, a numerical value to create categories. 
So there's four different scales of measurement. So in the future, you're going to be asked on, on the exam, you're going to be asked on labs, provide me the classifications and scale of measurement for this variable. So you really will be asked to provide the classifications, which is two, and then which scale of measurement is this um, number, is this va variable representing? And it's all about what the number represents. So when we're looking at nominal, so don't think number. Nominal to me always makes me think number, think name. So nominal is just a category. So an identity or category, like male versus female. In our software, we're gonna put one equals male and two equals female, but the values are meaningless. They're just placeholders. Um, same as political affiliation, whether you're Republican, Democrat, independent, those are just classifications, they're just categories, so those are nominal. And then there's ordinal. That's usually when things are ranked or put in some kind of an order. So um, think order for ordinal. Um, you have class rankings like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. The senior is a higher status than freshman, so there is a ranking there. It, it, it does have a, a higher value uh, than the freshman. So there is a, a ranking. So whenever you think ordinal, think ranking. And the hardest ones to determine between is interval and ratio. So um, interval data um, is basically when um, there is an infinite number of values uh, between um, increments, but the key is um, there is not an absolute zero, or there is no zero. There's either no zero or the zero doesn't mean there's an absence. So if we think intelligence test scores, you can't score zero on intelligence tests. There is a zero, which is a placeholder, but you can't score uh, a zero. And the zero is put there after the fact to just um, provide kind of a baseline there is, no, uh, there is no human that has zero intelligence. So it's an arbitrary zero. So um, interval data would also be, you're frequently given uh, uh, assessments where you say, oh, between a scale of one, and, one to five, how attractive do you find, I don't know, Brad Pitt, five being really attractive, you know, one being not very attractive. Well, there's no zero, right? Um, so that because there's a scale of one to five, it means this is interval data because there is no zero with an absence um, of, of some uh, characteristic. On the other hand, ratio is it, look, it might look like interval data, but there is a zero and the zero is meaningful. Now I know this sounds weird because height and in inches, no one is zero inches but that's where the measurement starts, and that's a true zero point. Whereas on intelligence scores, there is no zero. You can't score zero, and there isn't actually a zero. It might be put on there later as a representation, but there is no zero. Um, whereas height, that measurement tool that you're using does have a zero. So think about what is, is, is included in the measurement tool. Also think of like exam scores. You can have a zero, it means you've got no points. There's an absolute zero and that's ratio. So that's the difference between ratio and interval data. So again, on labs and on the exam, you'll be asked things like provide the classifications and measurement scales for these variables. So if I look at the first one and it gives me an example of gender, male versus female, I'm gonna say my classification is discrete data, discrete qualitative data on a nominal measurement scale, because discrete and qualitative are my classifications. With the second one, if we're looking at class rankings, I am looking again at um, discrete data, because these are just categories, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, discrete data. These are quantitative uh, data, believe it or not, because 
a senior um, is, you know, th three uh, years further in to their um, education than a freshman. So there is a quantity difference. It's not just quality. It's a quantitative difference. And the measurement scale is ordinal. So these are the things you would be looking at, two classifications and uh, uh, one measurement scale for each variable that you'll be looking at. And so hopefully that helps you when you're completing your um, uh, homework questions as well as the lab one and uh, the activities that you'll be doing in discussions and also on exam one. Please feel free to email me any questions or concerns and hopefully the video came through uh, well for you. Have a great day.